Warning, this episode contains spoilers and strong language. They said we're gonna put a play together Though we don't know yet what it's about We'll let everybody be in it So that there's no one left to be in the crowd No, you think I'm wasting time here Not sculpting up an image to play This is my last letter Welcome, everybody, to the latest episode of ShimmyCast. I am Noel, being joined once again by Angie. Welcome, everybody. And JD. Hello, hello. We are here with the second of our bonus episodes where we're looking at unproduced sequel scripts for The Lost Boys. And in our previous episode, we covered Lost Boys 2, written by Jeffrey Boehm, also known as Lost Girls. And I just showed Angie Empire Magazine had just done a big special bonus issue where they did a whole history of the Lost Boys. Unfortunately, I don't have the issue, so I haven't read all the articles. But one of the tidbits that came out of that was two actors that Joel Schumacher had in mind to play the Lost Girls were Drew Barrymore and Rosanna Arquette. Yes. Which, especially interested in Drew Barrymore, because within a Mm -hmm. few years of that, he then went on to work with her on 2000 Malibu Road, and again on Batman Forever. Never worked with Rosanna Arquette, as far as I was able to see. Yeah, I don't think so. Did you have any thoughts on that casting? It still comes down to that script, right? Like, ultimately, those two characters just didn't have a whole lot to do in them. I'm sure that Drew Barrymore would have done about as much as she brought to, what was her name in Batman Forever? Was she Sugar? Yeah, yeah, no, that's a good comparison. It would be a cute little role, but there's just not a whole lot for her to do there. No, that's a good comparison, was that in that script, it's like the Lost Girls were really just Sugar and Spice from the Batman movie. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, and Rosanna Arquette is interesting because she was a much older actress who was already in her 30s by then, who spent most of the 80s doing a lot of Mm rom-coms. So she was an interesting choice for that. I'm not sure how much success he would have had getting her in that. I mean, Drew, again, was kind of in a career slump at that point in the early 90s. So I could see her doing a smaller part. But Rosanna Mm -hmm. Arquette was still a leading actress. Yeah. That's an interesting little tidbit. Mm -hmm. Again, that they were putting enough thought into casting when they had that script in the works. Yeah. Yeah. But we've already discussed that script, and now we're here to discuss Lost Boys The Beginning, which was written by Eric Red from a story by Joel Schumacher and Eric Red. Before this, were either of you familiar with Eric Red at all? No. no. He was noted in the early 80s, he wrote this notorious screenplay that made the rounds. It's kind of like, again, like Falling Down and 7 and 8 millimeter. It was just one of those notorious scripts that floated around the industry called The Hitcher. And even when The Hitcher finally got made, it was this deeply controversial film that a lot of people loved and a lot of people hated. And he followed up by writing a couple other scripts called Near Dark, Blue Steel, and The Last Outlaw, and then started directing his own work with films like Cohen and Tate, Body Parts, Undertow, and Bad Moon. And unfortunately, his career sidelined in 2000 when he was involved in a fatal car accident where he fell unconscious at the wheel and his car crashed into a bar, killing two people. Mm. Oh. And he was so distraught on the scene of the crime that he actually tried to slit his own throat with glass from the window. So yeah, it was a period of years where he not only had to recover from that and go through a lot of therapy, but also was successfully sued civilly by the families of the people who died, which cost him everything that he had. Took about eight, nine years before he was able to get another film made, and that was 100 Feet, a horror film starring Fonka Johnson, followed by Night of the Wild. And he's since focused more on writing novels. Strange Fruit, Don't Stand So Close, It Waits Below, White Knuckle, The Wolves of El Diablo, and The Guns of Santa Sangre. So he's still sticking with horror, for sure. (laughs) Yeah, no, he's known for being one of those kind of high-concept horror film writers where it's like he just comes up with this great idea and then spins an entire story out of it. Mm. Hitcher, you pick up the wrong guy on the road, it goes terribly. Cohen and Tate, a couple of dirty cops kill a person not realizing a kid saw them. Mm. Bad Moon, which is the family dog versus a werewolf. (laughs) <laughs> so he's still around. He still writes. He's given a few interviews where he's briefly talked about the script, but never really gotten into much history. He was apparently commissioned directly by Joel Schumacher and appears to have been done around 1990, 1991. Okay. And my suspicion is that what killed this was in 1992 is when you had the release of Bram Stoker's Dracula. 
Hmm. And I think there's a little too much overlap in the Vlad the Impaler stuff that that might have hurt this one from getting made. It's a bit of a stretch, but I could see Hollywood thinking so. Well, or I might have also just killed Joel's interest of like, well, crap, now I have to come mm. up with a new way to do it. One of the films that Eric Red is most notable for, which was directed by Catherine Bigelow, was Near Dark, the vampire film that came out in the same year as The Lost Boys. Neither one was a huge hit in theaters, but both very quickly became cult hits on home video. And then it's interesting that Joel reached out to the writer of Near Dark to help write his prequel to The Lost Boys. Angie, what did you think of Near Dark? <sighs> it's not terrible, but I didn't like it that much. The biggest problem is I really don't like Bill Paxton. With his very over-the-top style, you're either going to be really into it or you're not. And How I'm one of the people who is not. dare you. <laughs> <laughs> so that's part of it. There's also the fact that our supposed hero starts off as a jerk. And then just sort of floats along and then somehow is a hero again. And I'm just not behind this kid at all. The female love interest has no real personality. It just feels like a lot of typical vampire stuff, ultimately. I agree with a lot of Angie said, except Bill Paxton is a treasure. <laughs> I am offended and I'm going to log off this call right now. I'm sorry. No, I get it. And he is very over the top. I found him the most entertaining because of that, because it is such a very quiet, slow moving film to have this big personality as if not your main villain, then at least one of the more showy of the villains worked mm -hmm. in its favor. But it is a very slow film that none of the characters are really all that likable for the most part. I liked it, but it's one that I probably will never go back and watch again without a reason. Mm. Eric Red is someone I've always had a mixed bag appreciation for. I like a lot of his concepts. I just don't always think he fully fleshes them out. And with mm. Near Dark, I love the gang of vampires. I love the dusty Western setting. I love the use of sunlight. I love how dark it gets, but again, it's like he's anchoring the story on a lead character that's just not interesting. The central mm. romance just isn't interesting. The final payoff doesn't really go anywhere. No. It's a really interesting script and concept that I still would have liked to have seen go through some more development and more work. And it's an mm. interesting companion piece to Lost Boys because I think while Near Dark is more focused and goes darker, Lost Boys is more interesting in just how vibrant it is. And as bland as Jason Patrick is, I still think he's a more interesting lead. I think him and Jamie Gertz at least have more charisma and chemistry than the leads in Near Dark. Yeah. Not that they're great and what they were we had a problem with them, but I think they were a little better than Near Dark. Yeah. It's weird seeing a young Adrian Pastar because I really am familiar with him yeah. from like the two thousands right. on Heroes. Well yeah, you never saw Solar Babies. No, no, I haven't. <laughs> Good for you. It always goes back to Solar Babies with you, Noel. <laughs> You're better off. He had a falcon. <laughs> <laughs> I'm really getting kicked off this podcast between the two of y'all. <laughs> I like Lance Henriksen. I like Bill Paxton. Mm -hmm. I like yeah. Jeanette Goldstein. And I like their idea of an evil kid vampire. Mm -hmm. But again, it's like an interesting set of villains. It's just I don't think the story built around them is all that gripping. Yeah, like it did make me wonder. I know obviously the interview with the vampire film was not made yet, but was the book out already? Oh, yeah. Because Homer is definitely, he has very shades of Chris and Dunst's yeah. character. And yeah, there's interesting stuff there. His interest in Caleb's younger sister has potential, but it never yeah. really goes anywhere other than an excuse to kidnap her. And I like the way they involve the dad. Right. Yeah, there's a lot of little things, but it just... Doesn't all come together. It doesn't all click. Well, you never even see like the family together until three quarters of the way through the film. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I wasn't even clear that that was his father and sister until halfway through the movie. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, why is this one guy just so concerned with finding <laughs> with this guy who just got <laughs> nabbed in the middle of his field? But I eventually pieced it together. But yeah, it was weird. Yeah, instead of the scene with him and the two friends in the beginning, maybe he could have been like leaving home to go out. Yeah. Another similar thing with Lost Boys is that I do feel like they were were trying to make some comparisons, or I guess he was, with runaways and drug use. Mm -hmm. But once again, it just never quite comes together to really work as a good metaphor. Yeah, he's become spoiled so he can no longer be a part of his old family, and now he has to be a part of this new one. Mm -hmm. I could definitely see that as a shared thread. 
again, I think what makes the film work okay is still just that dusty Western atmosphere to it. I think Catherine Bigelow directs it very well, but again, the foundation just isn't strong enough. Yeah. The only other Eric Red stuff I've seen is 100 Feet, which is okay, where it's a woman kills her husband in self-defense because he's abusive and then is sentenced to house arrest. But unfortunately, her house now has the ghost of her dead abusive husband in it, Mm. Hmm. which is an interesting concept. And the film, again, has a lot of really interesting bits and ideas. It just Mm -hmm. doesn't all fully come together. I think that's a shared thing with Eric Red of, I like his ideas. I would genuinely love to read some of his books just to see kind of what some of his ideas are in the raw. And I still really do want to see The Hitcher, but I just don't feel he fully fleshes out those ideas deeply enough. Quick editing note, in the time since we recorded this, I have seen The Hitcher. And it is a mess. The lead character isn't very interesting. The story's all over the place. The pace and structure is all over the place. But holy hell, is it a thrill ride that absolutely goes places. So I do recommend it. It is a fun watch, but it's a messy watch. I would also say I noticed it more reading the script, but I did also notice it watching Near Dark, too. His dialogue is not great. Yeah. Mm. People don't talk the way that, you know what I mean? Like, it's very goofy sometimes. There's a clunkiness to it. Yeah. Yeah. So then moving into this script again, all that I know about it, it was written in the early 90s. I don't have a specific date or time frame on that. And that I do know that Eric Red was also involved in writing a sequel to Flatliners, which he again worked on with Joel. But otherwise, I don't know any details about it. I don't know what the plot was. I don't know any timeline. These Lost Boys scripts are really interesting, but I want to know more about the history behind them. Why did they not happen? Like, especially this one of, I have that theory about Bram Stoker's Dracula, but Mm -hmm. who knows, maybe this was written after that and they were trying to cash in on it. But it strikes me more as they were just drawn to the Vlad the Impaler idea and it was just two things running on a similar course and Bram Stoker's beat them to the punch. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's my theory. But I would like to know more about that. I've never seen Joel talk about it. Other than him just mentioning the casting for Lost Girls, I've never really seen him get too deep into the development of the sequels other than, yeah, we were trying. Mm -hmm. But I would like to know a little bit more of the actual timeline. All right. So moving into the script itself. It's 1906 off the coast of San Francisco, California, a booming portside prospector town. A ship is heading towards the docks with its hold full of boxes from Romania. As the sun sets, a figure emerges from one of the crates. Long hair, white beard, powerful features, and a dapper sense of fashion. This is Vlad. He slaughters his way through the crew, feeding on their blood and dropping their bodies from the air, impaling them on the mast. In the town of San Francisco, we meet the Lost Boys, David, Paul, Marco, Dwayne, and Jasper, who roam the streets together as pickpockets, thieves, and hustlers. Despite scrounging for whatever goodies they can nick, we see David has a bit of honor as he returns one wallet to a prospecting family because it's literally all the money they own. As they gather on the beach to go through their pickings, they're attacked by Lomax, the local mob hood who runs the town. He and his gang rough the boys up and threaten them to stop encroaching on his territory, but before anything can happen, the unmanned ship suddenly plows into the docks. As men rally to get the boat tied down, a golden ring with the symbol of a comet falls into Marco's possession. And with a crowd gathered to see what the commotion is, David and the others look for some easy marks. They see the richly suited Vlad heading away from the dock and decide to take him on. As they surround Vlad, he seems amused by the boys and unthreatened. He notices Marco's new ring, telling them of the Order of the Dragon, the Romanian knights dedicated to wiping out the Turks, who would leave their fallen bodies impaled on stakes. He suddenly lashes forward, grabbing Marco's hand and bloodily crushing it. The other boys jump in but are casually tossed aside. David pulls out a derringer and fires twice, freaking out as Vlad goes down. Panicking, as this is the first time they've ever killed someone, they swipe Vlad's wallet and run away. Looking in the pouch, they find it filled with thousands of dollars worth of gold coins, so they buy horses and ride out of town, heading south to Santa Carla, a resort town centered on the opulent hotel atop the cliffs, which is catering to the social elites of robber barons and visiting royalty. Despite their street hood appearance, David throws around enough gold coins to get the side-eyeing staff to book them a room and lead them into the restaurant, where the boys are clad in suits and ties and bask in wine and cigars. As they take in the sights, we meet a teenage pair of European immigrant waiters, Victor and Radu Frogier, bumbling brothers who often chase after Grandpa, the grand patron of the original film, who is here a stray five-year-old boy always trying to sneak bottles of root beer from the pantry. 
and sitting in a private booth is the entourage of Princess Anastasia Rostov, daughter of the Grand Duke of Russia, who is hidden from view by her sour chaperone when she catches David's eye. The boys suddenly blanch when they see Vlad, calmly eating at a table across the room, turned away from them. He hands the waiter a napkin, who brings it to the boys, who discover it contains the two bloody bullets David shot into the man. As Vlad turns and raises a glass to the boys, they haul ass out of there, hopping on their horses and riding onto the cliffs out of town. It's night, and the laughter of Vlad follows them in the air. One by one, they're pulled off their saddles into darkness until David is left. Facing him is Vlad on horseback. As they charge one another, David again empties his derringer, then tries to grab the man, only for David and his horse to go sailing off a cliff into the night. In the morning light, David wakes up on the beach below the cliffs. He's fine, but the body of his horse is splattered on the rocks nearby. Walking back to the hotel, he finds the rest of the Lost Boys sleeping peacefully in the hotel room. He throws open the shades, and they cry out in pain at the light, but then try to piece together what happened the night before, eventually realizing that Marco's crushed hand is now fully healed, though the gold ring is gone. Seeing her sitting in the garden below, David breaks away from the others, plucks a flower, and makes his introduction to Anastasia. They flirt and flutter, bonding over thoughts of sailing in the sea. Her chaperone dives in again to break them up, but Anastasia leaves her locket behind, which David puts on. Vlad left a note for the boys, promising to pay them if they return to San Francisco to claim his crates of luggage. They do so, finding most of the boxes are filled with dirt, until they come across one filled with gold and jewels. As they ponder running off with it, they're again accosted by Lomax, who doesn't believe their reasons for again intruding on his territory. The sun has set by this point as Vlad appears, yanking Lomax off into the sky. As the Lost Boys start valiantly fighting off Lomax's gang, one goon after another are yanked away, and the victorious boys lose their smiles when they realize Vlad has impaled Lomax and the entire gang on the top mast of the ship. Amidst all this, Paul and Marco give in to their growing thirst and begin feeding on the body of slain goons. Shocked at what they've done, they decide not to tell the others, though it's seen by Vlad from the shadows. Vlad congratulates the Lost Boys and thanks him for protecting his cargo, and as they ride back to Santa Carla, he brushes off their previous confrontations with him as he's taken a liking to them and wants them by his side as he gets settled in. He promises them the hotel. As they laugh it off, he leads them into the casino and using his illusions and mind control powers to win round after round. As crowds gather and young ladies shift their attentions from the huffing robber barons to the beaming Lost Boys, Vlad finally breaks the bank. He publicly forces the manager into a massive wager for the entire hotel, and sure enough, Vlad and the Lost Boys now find themselves owners of the hotel. While chasing Grandpa, Victor and Radu come across the slain body of a chambermaid in the wine cellar and recognize the marks on her neck as being that of the Nosferatu from their old country. They sneak off to a local bookstore where they get a copy of The Ways of the Vampire and How to Destroy Him. While flipping through, they suddenly stop, recognizing a woodcut illustration of Vlad the Impaler, their new boss. The Lost Boys bask in their new fortunes, joining Vlad as they fire the snobby Mater D and chase huffy robber barons out of the best table. David wants to know why Vlad is including them in on this and what he wants from them. Vlad says he wants to offer the boys a chance to live forever. He removes an ancient bottle from his coat and starts passing it around, teasing the boys over whether it contains wine or blood. One by one, the boys drink it until it reaches David, who hesitates. He finally takes a sip, then spits it out, revealing the bottle is in fact blood. He's disgusted and says this is all too much, so he leads the Lost Boys back to their room. Vlad wishes them a pleasant day, then feeds on a robber baron before the sun rises. David emerges, the only one who can still tolerate daylight. He's confronted by Victor and Radu, who show him the book and try to warn him about Vlad, but he brushes them off. He runs into Anastasia, but is quickly blocked by her chaperone and bodyguards. As Anastasia and her entourage settle into the restaurant, they're told that their meal and a bottle of champagne are on the house, courtesy the owner of the hotel, and that the owner would like to meet them in the ballroom after. Entering the ballroom, filled with servants and musicians and grand chandeliers, they're met by David, dressed in tailored silks. The chaperone is embarrassed and backs off as David takes Anastasia out for a dance. They continue their flirtation, and as they're hidden from view by the pillars, their first kiss. Their courting continues with a picnic on the beach where they dream of being together and having the whole town beam in awe at their opulence. But Anastasia can't stay. She's due for schooling in San Francisco. As David sees her and her entourage off, he promises he'll make his way to San Francisco soon to be with her. Checking in on the Lost Boys that morning, David throws open the shade, but instead of pain moans, the shaft of sunlight causes Marco and Paul to violently burst into flames. The drapes shut, but the burns remain. That night, the boys head to the local lighthouse where Vlad hangs from the rafters, and demands he explain what happened to them. He bites open his own wrists and feeds his blood to Paul and Marco, who are fully healed. 
Dwayne and Jasper feel the hunger as well, but David clocks Vlad with a crowbar and demands the others think about what they've just done and seen, and drags them off. They fill their saddlebags with Vlad's jewels and ride off into the night, heading towards a train which will bring them to San Francisco in the hopes of finding a doctor who can fix them. Unfortunately, the sun rises and the boys begin to smolder as they race after an open boxcar. David gets them all in and seals them away from the sunlight. As dusk approaches, Vlad bursts out of the lighthouse and flies after them. In the boxcar, the Lost Boys awaken and, in their scalded pain and hunger, start to turn on David as the nearest meal. They go for him, shattering through the walls of the car with their newfound strength. They chase him outside and up along the roof of the moving train cars. They reach the last car, which David drops down and enters, and finds himself staring down 25 fully armed and uniformed marines. The roof suddenly rips open and Vlad is there, he and the ravenous Lost Boys violently tearing into the soldiers. In the melee, David is strafed with gunfire. As he lies there dying, Vlad looms above, making him one last offer. Yes or no? David nods. As Vlad and the others eat a photographer for some reason, David comes too, his body healed beneath the bloody bullet holes in his clothes. Vlad finally pulls the Lost Boys together to reveal his plans. They return so they could serve him as he uses this port town to begin creating new vampires to send overseas to infiltrate and overthrow other nations, establishing a new reign of vampires across the world. David scoffs at the notion and gets a chuckle when Vlad reacts in fright to a mild earthquake, which the California boys are used to. Despite Vlad's threats to no longer tolerate disobedience, David tells him to fuck off and storms out. Wandering into the garden, David is shocked to see Anastasia. When he didn't join her in San Francisco, she came back for him, but David pulls away. He's afraid of what he's become and doesn't want her anywhere nearby. Even as they kiss, he begins to change and feel the thirst. He pushes her away and she runs off. Rounding a corner, David finds Vlad standing there, Anastasia in his arms, his fangs in her neck. David screams. Vlad pushes Anastasia away, saying she's a gift for David, a mate he can now spend eternity with. As Anastasia asks what he means, what she's being turned into, Vlad shows her by going full vamp face. She screams and runs to the railing overlooking the cliffs. David reaches for her, but she's gone, her body impaled below on a jutting old pier in the crashing waves. David turns on Vlad and their fight begins. Unfortunately, not only is the sun beginning to rise, but the ground suddenly jolts. It's the big one, the San Francisco earthquake of 1906, and everyone in and around the hotel is thrown into chaos as a cave opens up in the cliffside, swallowing the entire hotel down into it. Amidst the chaos, Jasper is killed when he's fully exposed to sunlight and burns away. Down in the rubbled cavern, David and Vlad continue their fight, David ultimately impaling Vlad on an iron pipe. Vlad laughs, saying only being impaled on wood can kill their kind. He stops laughing when David pushes the pipe up into the sunlight and Vlad goes up into flames. That night, David emerges from the cavern and meets up with the other Lost Boys, all scalded by sunlight and mourning the loss of Jasper. As they see an approaching carriage, they delight in a potential meal, but the passenger is none other than Max, Vlad's brother, who just arrived in San Francisco to meet up with everyone when the whole town was torn open by the quake. As he promises to mentor the boys, Victor and Radu appear, saying they're glad to find other survivors. As Max and the boys welcome their new meal into the carriage and ride off, we move to five-year-old Grandpa sitting on rubble and sipping a root beer as he turns to the camera and says, Boy, oh boy, there's sure going to be a lot of vampires in Santa Carla from now on. <laughs> <laughs> Angie, do you recommend Lost Boys The Beginning and would you like to have seen it filmed? I would like to have seen it made. I do think it could have used a few more drafts. As I said, the dialogue is a little painful at times. Anastasia is not much of a fleshed out character at all. I don't mm. really understand why her chaperone is suddenly okay with David. Like, I get that he's got money now, but there's a lot more going on of why she's supposed to be protected. She's a princess. Come on. There's problems, but this David felt like the David from the first movie. Marco feels a lot like the original Marco. I could totally see Kiefer Sutherland and Alex Winter just having the time of their lives doing this. Vlad's not the best villain, but I feel like if you had a decent enough performance, it could still work. There's a lot of potential here, put it that way. JD. Yeah, this is a really great skeleton that just needs more fleshing out. Mm. I agree with Angie that David and Marco do feel like the original characters. And you can picture Alex Winter and Kiefer returning to these roles and getting a lot more to do and probably having a lot of fun doing it. 
I think the other Lost Boys just feel like other characters. The pack. Yeah. There's no real distinct personalities with them. I think a lot of the callbacks are ham-fistedly inserted. And I think the ending just really felt kind of rushed. But I can see taking this basic concept and a few more drafts, you could have probably made this into something a lot of fun. It's just not quite there yet. Yeah, I think it's an interesting enough script. There's a lot more that I enjoy about it than I don't. I think it's definitely a better script than the last one. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I would like to have seen how this would have been filmed. I think it's definitely a script that needs work. It needs some extra polishing here and there. But it's one that if you had just taken this and filmed it, I would still probably want to see that. I would actually like to see what Joel would have done with it. While the other one was very repetitive, this one Mm -hmm. put interesting new spins on a lot of the formulaic stuff. It did some really great character building for David. I thought some of the action scenes sound great. Absolutely, I'd love to see Joel Schumacher do a grand ballroom sequence. (laughs) It's one that, yeah, I think enough of this script works that I would like to have seen what this would have looked like on screen, even though I still wish that it would get a little additional work done. I think the timeline is a little confusing. There's a few too many. It's night, it's day, it's night, it's days. Mm. I think you could have tightened that up a bit. You need to find something more interesting to do with Vlad, because otherwise he's just stereotypical big bad guy. Mm -hmm. I think Max just comes in out of nowhere. Yeah. You either need to set up Max or save him for the next chapter. Yeah, it's not really necessary for him to show up at the end like that. Anastasia is very token love interest. On the one hand, it's a very male-centric story. On the other hand, we could amp up the homoeroticism even more. (laughs) Yeah, dialogue is very clunky, Mm -hmm. especially when it's the whole Lost Boys all bouncing around off of each other. Yeah. And then also, yeah, the Lost Boys, I wish were more fleshed out as actual, even Marco, I wish were more fleshed out as actual characters within the group instead of just being the group. Because they're very much the original film where on paper, they're Mm. not characters. It's just what the actors brought to them. Yeah, I'm okay with it because it is largely what we saw before, Mm -hmm. where Marco was sort of more interesting and everybody else was just literally in the background. But it would be nice while you're doing this to flesh out those characters and actually get to know them. Well, and I think Marco stood out in the original because it was Alex Winter. Yeah. Right. Because if it had been anybody else, I think you probably wouldn't have remembered him. You would have mm-hmm. just been like the first vampire killed. That's about it. True. But I think that's part of the reason why he gets a little bit bigger role than any of the other Lost Boys besides David in the mm-hmm. script is because by this point, Alex Winter had done the first Bill and Ted. Right. At least the first one, possibly the second one, depends on exactly when it was written. Right. At least it would have been an additional name to show mm-hmm. off a little bit, even if he was not the most famous of the wild stallions. (laughs) I think that's probably the reason why he gets a little bit more to do, but basically he's just best friend to David. Mm -hmm. Right. He doesn't really have too much of a personality. He's just there to be the guy who affirms whatever David wants to do. And he doesn't do that any more than the others do. Yeah. Honestly, that was the thing was as I was reading this, they're already a group of lost runaways and I got to Marco's name like, oh, hey, they were going to bring Marco back. I didn't even realize till after I'd read the script the first time that, oh, Dwayne and Paul were the actual other guys. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, I had to look up yeah. the names. Jasper's death has no impact, so I don't know why he's there. No. Did you notice that he gets a line of dialogue after his death? Yeah, <laughs> it wouldn't surprise me. There's a lot of errors in that yeah. script in general. Yeah, like because I want to yeah. say even David says in like the first scene, well, you know, Santa Carla is like this and like... You're in San Francisco. Then they're like, let's go to Santa yeah. Carla. It's like, wait a minute. It temporarily confused me of like, yeah. wait, I thought you just, oh, okay. Which makes me think this is a first draft. Yeah. It's a first draft and it's also a scan. So it's not the yeah. original. But then the only one that otherwise seems to get some character is Paul in his introduction seems like he's going to be an interesting character because for some reason they established that Paul's Native American and he's a street fighter. I thought that was Jasper. Is that Jasper? I can't remember. Give me one sec. I've got the script open. For some reason, I feel like it was Jasper was the one that was in the street fight, but I could be wrong. Uh, Let's see. Paul. Yeah. Okay. Paul is trapping teenage American Indian. Yeah. I don't need these irons. So why did you use them? As Jasper and Dwayne are going around robbing everyone. Okay. So Paul and Jasper were brothers? No, Jasper and Dwayne are brothers. Okay. I Wow. I don't know. Yeah. (laughs) Like I said, they all blend together. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. But the thing about Paul is that it seems like they're setting him up as being opposed to David because Paul is like, but I have money that I actually went and earned through doing day work and day labor jobs and doing this street fight that I didn't need to cheat in, even though you Mm -hmm. made me cheat, while David is, you know, scrounging and stealing. They set up this conflict between them, but that never goes anywhere. No. And Paul, I don't know why they made him a Native American with a mohawk and tribal scarring when that's not in the 
first film at all. Right. Because I believe Paul was played by an Italian musician. Well, I mean, it was still the 90s. That's what I'm trying to, like, is he the other blonde? No, he's olive skinned with dark hair. Okay. So I guess you could maybe say. You could squint and make it, maybe. but it's not. Maybe. It's not like we don't have a history of Italians playing Native Americans. Exactly. Right. But it's like they seem to set him up, but then like after that set up, he's just part of the crowd. And that's mm-hmm. my biggest issue with the script. And it's not a terrible issue, but it's one thing that I wish we would have done is build them as individual characters within this team. And instead of it always being David in opposition, have it be like each individual person is going through their own little vampire journey. Marco is the one who's like instantly falling into it because it's money, it's power, it's immortality. I got to drink some dead guys. So what? (laughs) Paul is the one who's more, I want to earn what I have. That mindset of, well, now you've earned your fate here. And Dwayne and Jasper are the two brothers who there's no personality to them at all. Mm. No. The way the story arc goes, all the Lost Boys get pulled over by Vlad, except for David. And yet David still keeps managing to pull the Lost Boys It's like David and Vlad have this whole back and forth where David pulls Lost Boys over, Vlad pulls Lost Boys over. And I would like there to be more complexity to that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. To be honest, the first act made me think that we were going to get that. Mm -hmm. Then Vlad comes in and then it's basically Vlad versus David. And so, Andy, what did you think about David? He's probably the strongest bit. I mean, once again, his dialogue isn't always great, but he's the most interesting character. You're my girl. Uh, I at least can understand why he goes from, oh, I'm totally against this to wait, I'm about to die. Okay, fine. I don't want to die right now. Like that at least made sense of why he suddenly changed his mind. I wish they hadn't felt like they had to give him a damsel in distress with a tragic death to push him toward being evil. But otherwise, I like him a lot. Yeah, I agree. He feels like a natural precursor to the David we see in the original Lost Boys. It feels like this is a guy who was always kind of a bit of a rebel, but at the same time had some morals. But those get stripped away because of chance and opportunity. I felt the most compelled by his story than anything else in this script. I actually like it a lot as a backstory for David, because I like that you're taking the villain and revealing that at one point they were a hero. I don't Mm -hmm. need to know their origin before they all met. They're all just runaways in an immigrant port town on the streets. I'm perfectly fine with we don't have any story of how they all met each other or where they come from. I like that essentially they're already the Lost Boys, but they're not killers. They're just pickpockets. They're not like fighting surf Nazis in 1906. And I like the idea that David has a kind of moral code where he'll steal, but he's not going to wipe out an entire family Mm -hmm. by stealing everything that they own. Like that moment where he returns the one wallet. But again, I don't quite get the journey of how this takes us to the David of the modern film, where he's essentially become Vlad. He's become the sadist. He's become cruel. He's become manipulative. Well, you got a good 80 years for him to get there. There needs to be more of David severing his humanity. They're trying to make that be Anastasia. Mm -hmm. After that point, and it's like, oh, yeah, we'll just eat the comic relief. (laughs) But it just doesn't sell. Yeah, it's not enough. You're not feeling it. Well, because Anastasia has only like two scenes with him for the entire film before she's killed. You don't really feel like this is a romance that would completely alter him. It was a hookup, essentially. And then it ends tragically, yes. But I don't think that would make me completely change my entire outlook on life. Ooh, I had a thought. Instead of the Froggy Air brothers, who we'll get to, and instead of like Anastasia being this opulent royalty, what if she was just a maid at the hotel? And thus you get these two people coming from this underclass point of view who are both seeing different sides of this hotel and different sides of the social class issues of the hotel. And both have that shared story of him now trying to pull her into the upper class and her being like, where are you taking me? How do you have all this? How are you able to take me where you're taking me? Maybe you could even then make a triangle with Paul, who is the whole, you got to earn your living, you got to earn your keep mentality, and her being drawn to the rich opulence, but also being afraid of it because it's too fantastical. I don't know. I'm just trying to think of like how you could Mm -hmm. make the love interest a bigger part of the story more spread throughout the story. Yeah. And then also she has the perspective of other chambermaids are starting to be fed upon. Yeah, I mean, it's hard because so much of the focus is on David. There's room in the script that you could redo it. Right. It's hard to imagine it sort of branching out to that. There's a lot of themes in here of like immigrants and class struggle and all that stuff. And you could do a romance that more builds into that instead of her just being the fantasy 
fantasy princess. Mm -hmm. Because by making her the fantasy princess, she spends so much of the story cut off from everyone. Whereas if you make her staff at the hotel, she's more directly involved in the entire evolution of the story. I could see it. To be honest, it would be an improvement on how Anastasia is actually used in the script. Another alternative would possibly be that as the princess in this privileged life, maybe she would embrace the idea of being a vampire because mm. it would mean freedom away from her responsibilities and her role. And that actually disgusts David? Possibly, or she's just another... Or she seduces him into the dark side. She's more of a temptation for him, right? To make him oh, consider yeah, yeah. the lifestyle. Turning her is the last stage to turn David. Like maybe she's the one who really just goes full vamp first. Mm -hmm. Ooh. Either way, I think there's definitely more you could have done with the character in that relationship. And I don't dislike mm -hmm. the idea of her throwing herself off the cliff at the end. But again, you just need to earn that moment more. I think the problem for me was right around the time when they were professing their love for each other and talking about how they're always going to be together was the moment when I realized she was going to die in order for him to get his right. moment. And so that was like, ugh. Well, and then it's also he's talking about all this rich, opulent wealth that isn't his mm -hmm. after he's already said, I don't want anything to do with you, Vlad. And it's like, do you really think Vlad is just going to let you walk away with all that wealth? <laughs> mm -hmm. right. You don't have any wealth. Vlad has all the wealth. Yeah. So it's just rang hollow. Mm -hmm. I'm perfectly fine with the whole initial meeting in the garden and then the ballroom scene and then the end off the cliff. It just needed more to string those pieces together. Mm-hmm. And then again with David, I don't entirely see how we end up with the character who then just becomes the badass guy in the original movie. And yeah, as you said, there's 80 years worth of journey there, but does that mean mm -hmm. we tell that story next? Let me ask you guys this. Did either of you think when watching the original film that David and the rest of the Lost Boys were almost 100 years old? I knew Max was old, but I didn't know that the others were. Yeah, not necessarily. I always got the feel that they were relatively recently turned, like within the last 10 years or something. I didn't ever get the impression that these were turn of the century street thieves yeah. from San Francisco. I never got that impression. They're definitely embracing the for then modern punk lifestyle yeah. that yeah, it does seem a little hard to whereas you expect a vampire who's been around forever to be a little bit more out of touch, maybe. I mean, you need a few years for Marco to grow out that rat tail mullet. <laughs> <laughs> and to be fair, if Max is leading them, Max was really yeah. good at blending in. Mm -hmm. I think that's where the idea that these are all four of the same Lost Boys, instead of just having it be David and Marco, and then maybe like losing several of them here. Paul is such a different character in the beginning of this script than he is in the movie. Mm -hmm. Just have it be a different character. Have it be that Paul is David's best friend, even though they're at odds, and it ultimately ends up with that friendship ending. Maybe violently, maybe Paul is the one who becomes the vampire hunting hero. He's the one who separates mm -hmm. from the group and takes the other direction of, now I have to stop everyone. Mm -hmm. Maybe David and Paul are both disgusted by this, but both get pulled. There's so much more. You have five characters here. <laughs> There's so much room right. to do different things with this whole collection of characters, and they all just become this lumped together team. Mm -hmm. And then it doesn't make sense that 80 years from now, it's still the same four, and they've only just brought in Star and Laddie, yeah. who yeah. still haven't fully turned, and they're now bringing in a third one. You would think mm -hmm. they would have gone through so many other members in that time. Right. I mean, even right. Peter Pan's The Lost Boys, they make a big point of it in the book that there have been dozens and dozens of Lost Boys that have come and gone over the years. Mm -hmm. Right. Some go back home, some get killed by pirates, and new ones keep coming all the time. Yeah. And I imagine many people like us would have been going, would, are Dwayne and Paul and Jasper even in the first? Like, they're so generic yeah. in the background that you don't remember mm -hmm. anyway. So yeah, you may as well just do different people. <laughs> Death by Rodeo. No. <laughs> it made sense to have a large gang so that you could then have the body count as they all die, but we don't even get the wild vampire deaths in this one because most of them don't even die. It's just Jasper. And both Jasper and Vlad burst into flames within five pages of each other. They have the exact same style of death. Yeah. Right. This script needed more work to really make it sing. It's a good first draft, but it needed more. Yeah. It's a good skeleton. It just needs a lot more to really flesh it out to make the character sing. Yeah. Yeah. I, I agree. <laughs> God damn it, cat. <laughs> JD, I need snacks. I'm shocked that Remy hasn't come to join his voice to it. <laughs> so, JD, what did you think of Vlad? 
To be honest, I spent half the film going, is this supposed to be Max? Because I just kept imagining mm. the actor from the original Gilmore Girls <laughs> grandfather showing up and trying to be Vlad the Impaler. And I'm just not really seeing like him with the mutton chops or anything like beard or whatever. But he's fine, but he's just being the arch vampire. I like the cat and mouse game that he has with the boys. Like that's fun, but that's all he has. There's really nothing more to him other than just, aha, you think you're going to kill me, but I'm actually in charge. He does that two or three times and it just gets old after a bit. We already know what vampires are like. Give us something really kind of interesting. Dig into like the history of vampires or something. There's some hints of that, but nothing that's really worth exploring. Yeah. My first thought was, did it really have to be Dracula? Like, mm -hmm. did we have to really have it have to be the first vampire? I think any old vampire would have worked okay. There's nothing here other than he clearly wants to set up franchises. Like, why <laughs> these boys? Why these idiots who bunglingly tried to rob you are the ones you decide you want to make your slaves other than that they're the first ones you really interacted with on land? That's really the biggest issue is that we don't really see any good reason why he's so enamored with them and wants to turn them into vampires instead of just making them food. My thought is I would have had Max involved from the beginning and I wouldn't make them brothers. Mm. I would literally play it as the dapper gay couple of vampires who are trying to adopt this gang of kids. And one is the barbarian and one is the socialite. And they have these two opposing philosophies. They both have the same goal, vampires conquer the world, but they have these opposing philosophies of one wants to build a society of vampires and the other just wants to brutally overthrow everyone. And they kind of love each other, but they also kind of snip at each other, you know? And I don't joke around. I would straight up play them as a couple who are just mm -hmm. these two ancient vampires. They've both been around for hundreds of years. They've ultimately pulled together. They've got this plan for conquest. Don't entirely agree on how to do it, but they're going to start in this port town and they're going to start with these boys. For the time period, I think that's a little too progressive than they'd be willing to go. Given how homoerotic the first film was, I would just say, let's crank it up a little higher. And I think having Max to counter off of Vlad would play off well. And also Max makes no sense in this story at all. How do the mechanics of the master vampire work in the original film? If David is the one who turned Jason Patrick's character, mm -hmm. why would killing Max have anything to do with Star and David in terms of curing them? Right. If he didn't create David, then David creating other people can't be foiled by stopping Max. That makes zero sense. It never did make sense. <laughs> the idea is that Max was the elder brother. They make a point of saying that. So therefore, he is the true head vampire. And Vlad is still underneath Max in the hierarchy. If you were just had them as a pairing where they created these kids together. Oh, yeah. Like I said, all the stuff that are callbacks to the original film feel really ham-fisted. It feels yeah. like somebody pointed out, well, Max was the head vampire. Oh, shit. Let me write an ending where Max shows up in the last two pages. Yeah. I think Vlad being the kind of stereotypical Vlad the Impaler Master Dracula guy would work mm -hmm. better if you had someone to counter him with or play him off of. Or if you even want to just erase Vlad entirely and have it be Max from the beginning as the socially dapper mm -hmm. vampire. Or if you want yeah. to do a pairing, have like an Elizabeth Bathory type that he's with. Like this upper crust snob couple. Well, part of the what made the original Lost Boys, and it wasn't necessarily the first to do this, but it was definitely riding that wave of in the 80s where all of a sudden we're introducing vampires who are not that stereotypical Dracula, Bela Lugosi style vampire. Mm -hmm. And to go back to that and not really do anything new to it, it really seems like a step backwards. Yeah. You could have that be the ultimate crisis in the film is you got these rebellious Lost Boys and the old school vampire, but that's not really how it's played out because they seem to be okay with him up until Anastasia's death and then David decides no this sucks if he yeah. had made it more of an ideological fight you could do something right. interesting with it mm -hmm. but if you're just gonna have him be Dracula there's no point we've all yeah. seen that before in a million other films on the plus side, having a dapper socialite vampire again plays into the social themes that they're exploring here in class issues. On the other, how would Max go from wanting to conquer the world to running a video store? Well, I don't think Max wants to conquer the world. See, and I think that's the big reason why you can't involve Max in that plot, unless you just undo the whole world conquest thing. 
But doesn't he even say that's my crazy brother? He liked to do that stuff. Yeah. I'm not interested in that. So I don't yeah. think he's interested in world conquest at all. I know, but I'm just right. thinking if you erase Flag and you made Max the main enemy, do you also mm-hmm. then remove that entire plot? Yeah, you may as well. I mean, yeah. it really had no bearing. It's not like we ever leave Santa Carla. Right. But the thing is, if you have Max involved throughout, and Max, we know, doesn't get beaten until the next film, who is the main opposition to overcome at the end? That is where I think then you can refocus it on Paul versus David. And Paul is the one who David ultimately has to take down, even though you're playing Paul as the hero and David has now become the villain. So it technically becomes a story about the villains winning. It's a hard story to figure out how to rejuggle it. Yeah. Because David isn't technically a hero. It's just Vlad's a worse villain. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Maybe by the end of it, Max and David have an uneasy truce and agree to do their own thing. And that's why it doesn't really seem like in the actual movie we got how the two of them are really working together in any way. But what's your climax? Is it just the earthquake and then the vampires are in opposition until nature literally strikes and that brings them together as a family? The end doesn't quite work. No. You kind of need Vlad, but he's unsatisfying, but he's necessary for a climax. And if you erase him, then what do you do for your climax? I think you just need to write him better. Yeah. Yeah. It's one of those things where it's like, I'm trying to figure out how to fix the script, but it just makes it harder. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Who would you have cast as Vlad? Mm. Gary Oldman. Because I'm subtle. Can't pick Gary Oldman. Uh, Donald Sutherland. (laughs) Ooh. You know, that actually might be fun. Yeah. See, I was going to go Liam Neeson, who was already doing like Rob Roy and Darkman around this time. Sure. Yeah, sure. Donald, why not? (laughs) Make it interesting. Buffy wasn't around yet. Yeah. At least I was seeing someone a lot like him. Like, definitely an older guy is what I was picturing. And I think that would be a fun conflict to pit those two actors against each other that I Mm -hmm. think they could have fun with. Yeah. Yeah, I could see it. So, Angie, Mm -hmm. what did you think about the Frogier brothers and Grandpa? (laughs) So, I get why Grandpa's here, but his role works about as well as this little twist did at the end of the other film. Like, okay, fine, I guess. The Frog Brothers, let's just call them the Frog Brothers. Yeah. They're amusing. They have some fun scenes. The only thing is, do they die at the end? Yeah, they're eaten. Are they ancestors of the Frog Brothers we know? Is it just a coincidence? It's a coincidence. It's a little goofy, I guess, but I do feel like they are kind of a necessary part of the story that I understand why you bring at least an analog of them back. So I'm happy they're there. (laughs) Uh, Grandpa was unnecessary. It felt like somebody added it last minute. He really doesn't do anything in this script to really necessitate him being there. It's just a callback for callback's sake, which can be fine, but that last line of dialogue is so painful. I don't think you could ever make that work. (laughs) As far as the frog, frogier, Victor and Radu, whatever you want to call them, I like them. I'm on the same page as Angie. If it's supposed to be their ancestors, then the implication is that they're dead at the end of the film, so they better have (laughs) kids somewhere, or it's just a coincidence, and that's really not that much better as far as being satisfying. Mm. I did picture they got Corey Feldman and Jameson Newlander back in those roles. They were written as one who's very fat and one who's very thin. I don't care. (laughs) That's that's what I pictured in my head. Mm -hmm. Because they actually never say their names. I mean, you see in the script. They never call them the frog ears. Yeah. Right. So there would be no way for the audience to know that in the script unless they watch the credits. And that might be a fun way to do it. Just have them be Victor and Radu and not necessarily be frogs and bring back the original actors and just have them be goofy, fun distractions. Yeah, I guess that's another thing about Grandpa, too. Obviously, no one would be calling him Grandpa. Exactly. So you just see this little rambunctious kid in the beginning. And then when he turns to the camera at the end of the movie, you'd be like, oh, it's Grandpa. Okay. They do reference his love of root beer, but yeah, I mean, you have to be a really hardcore fan to remember that. Exactly. All that you would need to do to sell that end bit is just change the line. He's sitting on rubble, watches the carriage go away, and just says, goddamn vampires. That's all you need. You don't need him to turn to the camera. You don't need the boy, oh boy. (laughs) And even just have him be like, you he's got a cut on his head from everything. He's tying a bandana on his head. That's all you need to sell it. I like the Mm -hmm. idea of having this little kid who just constantly pops in and out of the story, who then turns out to be Grandpa. 
But the thing is, beyond his introduction, he has one more scene, and then you never see the kid again for like 50-odd pages of the script, and then he has mm-hmm. that bit in the ending. But he's otherwise mm-hmm. not involved in the story. He's not involved in the climax. The whole earthquake happening and hotel collapsing into this cave needs to not just be two pages. And you mention all the hotel staff and guests are freaking out. But no, you need to involve the hotel staff and the guests in that whole climax and make that the centerpiece of the entire climax. And unfortunately, Mm. they don't stretch it out enough. They don't involve all these other people in it. Again, Victor and Radu disappear from the story. And then just pop up again at the end. Yeah. They're not involved in the third act. They're not running around as this earthquake is happening, as this vampire battle is happening. Okay, you have all this staff and all this guests at a hotel that has a vampire battle happening in the middle of it during an earthquake, during the sunrise, during the collapse into a cave. That's a lot of elements to have a lot happening in. And it's just as rushed through. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I actually had to reread through that section a few times because yeah. to be honest, there's just so much going on. And the way he he writes is not necessarily relaxed reading. He's kind of a choppy writer, yeah. 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 So I had to piece it all together in my head after like yeah. a couple readings. And then that's following on the tales of the whole train chase sequence, which I like as a sequence a lot. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Like especially where David is now being chased after by the other Lost Boys who are so lost in their hunger that they're just going right. to eat the nearest person, even if it's him. Mm-hmm. And then it leads to this whole train car full of Marines. The roof gets ripped off and it's Marines versus vampires, bullets and blood. A lot of great visual spectacle. David takes the bullets. I think that's a really nice sequence, but it also kind of blow in your mm-hmm. wad early. And then that's your exciting sequence so that when you have the actual earthquake that collapses the hotel into the cave, it's so abrupt that it's like yeah. your energy's already been spent. It's almost like we saw a hotel in a cave last time, so we need a reason for it to be there. Let's hurry up and make it happen. And I'm fine with that. I'm fine with the fact that this entire story is built around that hotel. And again, getting into the social and class and immigrant stories and the port town. And I love the idea of all these different factors built around this one town and mm-hmm. what you can do with that. I just don't think the story does enough with they don't all do of that. do anything with it. Yeah. And that by the time you get to your grand climate, Max of literally this hotel getting sucked into this thing, all this chaos mm-hmm. happening. It just happens so quickly. Right. You really needed to sit down, give that sequence more room to breathe as the climax, put more thought into all of the stray threads that are now going to be converging upon that climax. Like all the stray threads converge on the train scene, especially with the Lost Boys mm-hmm. and David and all that. Mm-hmm. And instead it needed yeah. to focus more on the climax. Again, redo the whole romance love interest plot. You could have more heavily involved that in that sequence. Anastasia comes up and is now caught up in the whole climax as David's fighting the vampire while the hotel's collapsing, while everyone's figuring out the chaos of the earthquake. Anastasia's in the middle of it. You could have done more there. Victor and Radu running around trying to stop the vampires while helping people. Grandpa. Mm -hmm. All this stuff could have been involved in this whole hotel collapse. Yeah, it's far too focused on David the whole time. Yeah. Is what it ultimately comes down to. I have no problem with making this the story of the hotel and making the hotel such an intrinsic part of the story. They didn't nail the landing. I wonder how much of it was knowing because this was a point where Kiefer was a really big star Mm. to try to cash in on that. And so they focused a little too much on that instead of letting the story breathe. Well, you can still have David drive the climax even as all this is happening around it. Sure. But you know what I mean? Like, that's just my guess of why it is so single focused. Well, even if Kiefer had never became a huge star, I think he is clearly the leader of the Lost Boys. Sure. Yeah. Restructuring the climax doesn't mean you make get less focused on David. It just means you bring up mm-hmm. the additional focus on all the other things that converge. Right, right. Right. The ending is still David versus Vlad. What are the mm-hmm. elements surrounding that that all become reliant mm-hmm. on that convergence? But now we hardly ever leave David's point of view. Yeah. In pretty much the whole mm-hmm. story. And again, we needed a better build to the romance. We needed more conflict among the team, different arcs to the various team members. And you don't need to sacrifice David to get that. You just need to bring everything else up to the same level that David's at. Mm -hmm. So it's not just David's story. It's David's story amidst this. But I do like a lot of the action set pieces, like the whole horse chase along the cliffside. I like the whole fight with the gang members who end up impaled on the mast. I like the train chase sequence. I love the whole riding towards the train as the sun is rising and everyone is starting to burn. 
Definitely some uh, near dark yeah. comparisons there. Yeah, he definitely brings in some near dark sensibilities to this. Mm -hmm. But again, like I think what you lost was the variety of the first film because mm -hmm. it's just sunlight and fire. That's the entire thing we see kill vampires in this. Yeah, one thing probably even in the first scene, you know, where he impales all of the sailors or whatever on the ship. I'm thinking like, man, this is really gory for the victims. But then I realized, well, because vampires can't really die in this movie, I guess they felt like they had to make all of the victim deaths a lot more gory to try to match the over-the-top yeah. gore of the first film. I don't know if that necessarily works. I feel like there's something a lot more interesting of watching vampires bloodily explode than seeing victims torn apart. Exactly. Yeah. Well, especially just how over-the-top they went in the film with like the one who goes into the tub mm -hmm. and it just goes bonkers. And then again, death by stereo. And right. they had fun with it. Mm -hmm. That's one of the things I was going to say. Like one of the big changes for me is this feels a lot closer in tone to Near yeah. Dark than the original Lost Boys because Lost Boys I consider it to be it's a comedy horror action movie. Yeah, yeah, it's not yeah. much of as a comedy as some other comedy horror films, but it's definitely got a lot of comedy elements. Mm -hmm. This is more of a western. Victor and Madu are kind of funny. Grandpa I think was intended to be funny, <laughs> but yeah, for the most part, it's very straight. Yeah, I think you almost should consider it like a spinoff and not like a prequel because it's really not in tone anything like the original. Partially, I don't mind that because I don't mind this expansion of the universe. Again, like I'm perfectly fine with this being backstory for David, even though it still leaves a big gap between, well, okay, how did he get from the end of this to the beginning of that? Yeah. But it's still a good story and something that I could see as a backstory for David. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think as backstory for David and Marco, you still needed more with Marco. Like I think a great thing to involve in the third act would be if Marco has fallen so far under Vlad's sway, but then makes a choice to then help David. And then that reunites those friends. Right. Yeah, any kind of personality at all would have yeah. <laughs> helped them. Yeah, because I remember like there's that one scene where Marco and somebody else were feeding on the gangsters. Yeah, Marco mm -hmm. and Paul. And they keep it secret. You'd think that's going to have this big reveal like, oh, we've been vampires for a while to pay off. And I guess maybe that's later in the hotel when he opens up the window and one of them catches on fire. But it doesn't yeah. feel like a natural extension of, oh, we're keeping this a secret. Right. right. You, usually there's a big reveal when you have that sort of thing in a script like this. And this doesn't really ever pay that off. Yeah. You then have the dinner sequence where the four of them drink the blood. Paul and Marco are now fully turned and are fully under Vlad's sway. They are full vampires because they have fed and they have drank the blood. Mm -hmm. Dwayne and Jasper have drunk the blood, but they are not fully turned. So they're kind of basically where like Star and Jason Patrick were. So they're the half vampires. David is still pretty much fully human. He can still go out in the daylight, can still go out and live his life. And that's what I actually kind of like is that David is the last one to turn because he's the one who now has the potential. He could still just walk away from this all and live a different life. Mm -hmm. And again, that's mm -hmm. where I think we needed more to then now fully pull him in. Okay, so you have the dinner sequence where Vlad does the bottle. David wakes up the next morning, goes down with Anastasia. And then that night is with Anastasia in the ballroom. And then the next morning is with Anastasia on the picnic blanket and then says goodbye to her and she leaves. And then another night goes by and then the next morning, David opens up the window and it starts burning Paul and Marco. Now, you've just had two nights go by where we don't know what happened with any of the other Lost Boys. Mm -hmm. We've had two days of David and Anastasia, but we haven't seen what these other Lost Boys have been up to for the entire two nights following the sequence where they drink the blood. That's bad plotting there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You're not supposed to pay attention to that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, if the Anastasia ballroom and picnic had all happened in one day, mm -hmm. you could make that work. Right. We've been tearing apart this script a lot, but I still think I would rather have seen this get filmed than the Lost Boys 2 script that we had read. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. Mm -hmm. I still think it has a lot of good ideas that work there. For all of its atmosphere and tone, I don't mind doing a more historical Western style horror story. I just would have brought in another writer to come in and definitely remap yeah. out the plot. Definitely redo the dialogue. Mm -hmm. But I think it's a good enough first draft that, yeah, I would have liked to have seen what this would have become. Mm -hmm. I agree. Hey, that photographer scene. 
<laughs> There's your comedy, I guess. Which again is so oddly placed. It's like you have the death of David on the train. Mm -hmm. Cut to Vlad and the other Lost Boys doing this whole photographer scene, which to tell the audience is basically them all dressed up and posing for a photograph. The photographer going like, wait, why are they not registering on film? They eat him. Yep. And then you cut to from that David waking up from having died the night before. <laughs> They were celebrating the fact that David finally decided to join them yeah. by going out and killing a photographer. I don't know. It's just oddly placed. Yeah. I could see it as being part of that montage where they're like gradually you know, becoming wealthy and rising up the ranks in the hotel. Mm -hmm. But yeah, it just doesn't know. Yeah, that would work better because they're not turned yet. But maybe Vlad doesn't show up in the picture. Yeah. They're like, what the heck? And then he eats the photographer. Yeah. Yeah, you could do that in a much better way. And that would be an interesting photo where it's like Vlad doesn't show up, two of them are translucent, and the other three mm. show. That would be interesting. Yeah, something like that. Yeah. What would you think about the whole casino sequence where he's using mind tricks to win all the money and ultimately getting the hotel? I think you'd probably edit that down because, to be honest, it went on, I think, a little bit too long. And it wasn't that long of a scene, but it just felt like, okay, we get it. He has mind control or hypnosis powers that make people think he's winning. Yeah. We just established that he has a whole crate full of gold and jewels and he needs to use the casino to win the hotel. <laughs> he needs just a little bit more. Yeah. Then you have to have the whole thing of all of the women stop looking at who they're with and start looking at the boys in a lustful fact. Like, why? They're not the ones that are winning. Shouldn't they be all after Vlad, yeah. if anything? Like, it doesn't really quite make sense. Yeah. I mean, it would make more sense if Vlad was, like, passing the dice around and, like, each of the Lost Boys was, like, doing yeah. a roll and Vlad was doing his trick to help them win. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that would actually right. do a little bit to, like, make you think, oh, he's weighing the boys over. Yeah. Mm -hmm. As opposed to, like, him just showing off his power. It's him, like, oh, hey, bet on red or roll these dice or whatever, and then they start winning. I do like the joke that it doesn't matter what they bet on. He just makes it look like they win. Yeah. But he you really have to see it that many multiple times to get the idea. Right. Again, it's like, I like the idea. There's enough here, though. I'm glad I read this. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. It's interesting. Yeah. And this is one where I could see someone reworking it as a comic story. I think it's a good mm -hmm. enough story. I'd still like to see it be told in some fashion. Especially like that train sequence. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's going to probably be my headcanon of how David is <laughs> turned, because I think that makes a lot of sense. But mm -hmm. a lot of the rest of it, yeah, I can take or leave. Yeah. The one thing, though, is relying on a train car to block the sunlight, as we know from the music video for Lost in the Shadows. <laughs> Well, when you don't poke a bunch of holes in it. <laughs> yeah. Part of me wanted to see this movie just to see what Joel's soundtrack for it would have been like. <laughs> just imagining Joel designing and shooting like a 1906 San Francisco kids on the street. Like him doing his version of Oliver and all the kid thieves and all that stuff. And, you know, a street fight and the whole big ballroom sequence, the train ride, a train car full of soldiers fighting off vampires. I would love to just see how Joel would have filmed all this. Mm -hmm. It's so much more exciting just conceptually than the last script, which was he'll do the same thing. Right. So what instrument would Tim Capello be playing oh. in 1907 <laughs> on the beach? Tim Capello with lute. <laughs> I'm, I'm guessing like an accordion or like, you know, something. Like organ grinder or something like that. Have him be the other guy in the street fight. Seriously. <laughs> Yeah. You beat him with brass. I mean, he's fit He's enough, got the abs. But... <laughs> yeah, instead of little lead bars, he gives him brass knuckles, so you beat the saxophonist with brass. <laughs> mm -mm -mm. I would love to have seen what Joel would have done with that. I would love to have seen what the soundtrack would have been like to this. You wouldn't just do like the punk 80s stuff. You would do something. Mm -hmm. maybe, well, you could do something that is a blend of a modern aesthetic with a classical Western fare. Yeah, you've got options. It makes me curious to see what it would have been like. Mm -hmm. JD, any final thoughts? No, I think we've covered it pretty well. Angie? Yeah, I'm good. Are you looking forward to the direct-to-video Corey Feldman sequels? Mm -hmm. Now that you know that we get those instead of these? I'm looking forward to the Vertigo comic. I am genuinely looking forward to that. Yeah, the comics I'm looking forward to a lot more. I think the comic will have a lot more license to do a lot more stuff than what I suspect the direct-to-video budget will allow for in the film stuff that we'll get. What I'm more curious about the direct-to-video ones is tonally, what are they going to be like? Mm -hmm. Is this going to be like gritty direct-to-video action movies, or are they actually going to try to capture that tone? Some of the humor. Yeah. 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 
I can see that, but we'll see. Yep. And I'm going to be curious to see if this Lost Boys TV pilot ever actually sees Light Day because they're reshooting it for the second time. One version or another, right? I know, because they filmed it. They went and reshot 80% of it. Now they scrapped it and are rewriting and shooting a new pilot. So. Yeah. So I'm curious to see if we ever get that Lost Boys TV series or are we actually going to get the St. Elmo's Fire TV series before the Lost Boys TV series? <laughs> <laughs> we might. That at least seems easier to make. I'm still kind of surprised that, like, of all the Joel Schumacher films to make a TV series out of, they're going to go with St. Elmo's Fire. But then if you think about, like, Parenthood and This Is Us, that six mm-hmm. people dealing with life. Yeah, dramas don't ever really go out of style, so. It's basically doing Friends as a single camera drama. God, oh, I just imagine, like, let's do a reboot of Friends, but as a single camera drama. Oh, God. Can you get rid of Ross? Could I be any more <laughs> addicted to meth? <laughs> There you go. I'm assuming that this one camera drama is going to become a lot more serious and have a lot more heavy issues. Of course. (laughs) Marcel the monkey is actually Ross's dealer. (laughs) Like the dramatic rendition of Smelly Cat. Yeah. I appreciate that. (laughs) Hey, I mean, your cat had some really incisive commentary on this one, so let's bring them back. Mm -hmm. (laughs) He's going to replace me. Yeah. Yep. (laughs) All right, so that brings this episode to a close. Thank you for joining us again, Mm -hmm. JD. Thank you for having me. Yes. Good night, Angie. Good night. For additional episodes or to leave a comment, please visit schumacast.blogspot.com. That's S-C-H-U-M-A-C-A-S-T dot blogspot.com. Our opening song, Letter, and our closing song, Vein Blossom, were both created by Jack Locke and are used with permission. To hear more, please visit jacklock.com. That's J-A-K-L-O-C-K-E dot com. Schumacast is in no way affiliated with Joel Schumacher or the copyright holders of the films discussed. All rights are reserved and no infringement is intended. 